Hyxaringen för den bråkna Kven skall singe meg? I dauds venna slinge meg Når egg i heil vegen går Og de spore egg tror Er kalle så kalle Der fei deia frender der sjover het same en oor stier der al dregi, hem er seer go dan getter. The year is 860, and the continent of Europe has been experiencing a sustained crisis. In the south, Louis II is Holy Roman Emperor. He has continued the work of his great-grandfather Charlemagne in spreading Christendom throughout the continent, completing the work of the many monks who'd set out into the so-called heathen lands, but this time it is a conversion by sword and by fire. He has also encountered the fury of the Northmen, who have stayed his ambitions for now. They have come in waves into the river systems of the for now fractured empire. To the west, the island of Engelund is ruled by the Anglo-Saxons, who were not only pagans upon their arrival to the isles, but shared ancestors with the Noronir or Northmen the very same Northmen who had swept aside Anglia and great swaths of Northumbria and Mercia to create an area of land for them to settle, called the Danelaw. Turning towards the homeland of these Northmen, we have in the south Horik II of Denmark, who has a tenuous grip on the lands he occupies. In the northwest, a series of petty Norse kingdoms sit alongside the Jarl of Ladir, sometimes in conflict, sometimes in peace, always restless. Further to the east, the lands of the Gotar, and north of them, the Sphere. You are of the Sphere. And while in future generations they may attempt to say there was no culture here, your people certainly existed, and the culture was as deep as the mountain valleys that swept into majestic fords to the west, and as permanent as the rune stones, if they remain cared for by future generations. Your father Bjorn had wanted to call you Ulf, which simply meant wolf in the language of your people, but your mother Alia objected. She was a Sassisk, or Saxon Freiling, or Freeman, who had come north from Westphalia in the Saxon homeland with her mother after her father and many of the rest of the men in the family had died at the hands of Charlemagne the Terrible. He was a greedy, bloodthirsty tyrant who had fought the Saxons and other tribes and forced them on pain of death to convert to his cross. They had fled north through the lands of the more southern Noranir and then through that of the Gotar before arriving here in the Bay of Melar. Your mother's gods were much the same, although the names were slightly different. Where your people would say Odin, your mother would say Vodun. She was particular with their names, as the Saxons felt the gods had originated in their lands. This is where the debate of naming Yulf came in, although it was really not much of a debate. Your father could hold no firm ground when your mother's tongue would utter the Saxon Achvo, which was a set of two words meaning both nonsense and no way. When these words were uttered, your father would retreat from the discussion and acquiesce to your mother without further words spoken between them. We will call him Wolfgabjorn. It means Wolfspear and was the name of his grandfather, she had said. The name was apt. You were both strong and agile and skilled from an early age with all manner of weapons, but the hammer was your specialty. Your father was already a man in his fourth decade when you were born and his body was a culmination of both hard work farming and the many battles and raids he'd been a part of. He was now a man in his early 60s, and while light farm work was doable, the heavier tasks were not. And despite his pride and stubbornness, you knew well the toll the work took on him, and you did your best with what was required. Your father's only remaining kin was your uncle Ulfbert, whose name meant Bright Wolf and who was the source of your father wanting to name you Ulf. He not only assisted your father with the farming work, but was the main smith for your local cluster of farms. 
you have apprenticed under him since boyhood, learning the ways of the forge, including the secrets of the smiths. Your uncle had told you how Loki had attempted to steal the secret of smithing from the dwarves. They soon discovered his deceit, and they chased him out onto the open plains of men and surrounded him. He fled, dropping the secret of steel, but when the dwarves attempted to find it, the coming armies of men forced them back to Svartlefheim in Midgard. We men found the secret of steel, he had said, and we had passed it from father to son ever since. Your people wore the clothing typical, bright, dark reds, yellows, and purples, and those of higher stations, the much rarer blue. Colors were mixed according to the desire of each individual, so trousers, sweaters, and capes rarely conformed to a single color. Your farm was one of thousands that dotted between the villages and small towns spread out along the Bay of Melar, which itself stretched for over 120 kilometers before emptying out into the Oustmar. The lands here were fertile and relatively flat for many kilometers out past the shore in every direction. It participated in small raids and petty conflicts, but you were about to undertake a journey that would not only try your every skill, but shake the foundation of your known world. In early spring of 860, a series of the largest things in a generation were held in the largest villages along the bay. These were the largest things in your lifetime, and your father and mother recalled the last of this size being held when armies were sent east to fight the Marius, Vesis, and Krivich Slavic tribes in the east. The law speaker at your thing was Frode Eriksson, who was also a scald of some renown. His songs and tales of the gods, warriors, and shield maidens were epics not to be missed. He would travel along the length of the bay, and whenever he was at any of the nearby villages, you would do your best to attend, work permitting. Your favorites were the tales of Thor and Mjolnir, and of course Freya, of whom your mother also knew every tale. Froda began as he often did, laying the groundwork for his speech. The groundwork in this case was the defeat suffered at the hands of your people against the tribes in the east. Our brave fathers, uncles, and even grandfathers fought and died on the eastern shores. He then leaned in for dramatic effect. Was it treachery? Many in the crowd jeered in response. Well, my brothers and sisters, you will be surprised to learn, as he left the crowd hanging on the upcoming surprise before continuing, that Rurik has been asked by these very same tribes to come back across the Austmar and lead them. Apparently, they have been fighting amongst themselves all these years and require Thor's hammer itself to put things back in their place. The crowd jeered. Rurik and his brothers have asked that all men of fighting ability join his fleet across the Austmar. Unless there is any concern, the bringing of peace will, of course, require the acquisition of plunder, for not all want the peace. There will be more than enough for all. The crowd erupted in cheers. That evening, your father and uncle sat you down. Your father was never one for words, preferring to act through deeds and example. Your uncle, however, he understood the value of words, and he could use them to exert great influence, whether from tax collectors or haggling merchants. He spoke. Wolfgar, we are both old men. But Freeman resigned to what time we have left. Do not worry on us. Besides, your mother and her fiery tongue are here to keep us in line. We have a gift for you. He presented you with the finest war hammer you had seen. I have named it Fenrir, and it has two heads, one for trapping and crushing, the other for cutting and biting. You thanked your uncle, overcome by the beauty of the hammer. Your father, though, only smiled, but he held you tight for much longer than was usual for him. The next morning, your mother had your things ready and packed for you. 
She took you aside and uncharacteristically had moisture in her eyes. She was not a mother that had coddled or hugged you much. In fact, you remember few instances of actual deep affection. But you had no doubt she loved you in her own unique Saxon way. Like your father, her actions spoke for themselves. She had prepared your bags, and the moisture in her eyes showed you that she cared. Inside those bags you knew she had packed your tweezers, razors, combs, and ear cleaners, as cleanliness was as important to you as it was to her and the rest of your people. She lifted the only earthly possession still tying her to her father, his wolfskin cloak, and tied it around your shoulders. We Saxon believe the wolves are the bridge keepers between us and nature. They sent us envoys in the form of dogs to remind us of our place in this world. We take, but we must also protect just as they do the balance of things. Remember that always, Wolfgar. Pulling you aside, she met your gaze and handed you a necklace with two amulets, one of Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, and the other of the goddess Freya. To look over you and return you safely to us, she said. And those were the last words you had heard from your family on that last day. For your father and uncle had drunk mead into the late hours of the evening and were snoring like boars among the goats and chickens you shared your homestead with. You had been a loner in a highly social society since boyhood, with few friends, much of it stemming from your mother being viewed as an outsider by the other families. Their kids would tease you about her accent and about your father wedding her. You could tolerate general insults hurled at a distance, but any that included your family saw you dispense Tours justice with bare hands if necessary. By the time you started to fill out, insults were rare within earshot, but your reputation as an outsider living among your own people had been sealed. The nearest village was a few kilometers east, and it was there you would embark on a ship to take you and the rest of the men from your region to Agna Fit. Agna Fit was the town that sat where the bay met the opening of the Ausmar. This was a rare day with not much wind, so you and the other men began the process of rowing. Your people's ships, unlike those in other lands, were double-ended. This meant you could turn around by simply turning the sail or rowing in the other direction if there was no wind. Predictably, those who came from the neighboring farm exchanged few words with you. Not that you wanted them to, you enjoyed the sound of the regular interval of the oars dividing the water, pushing the ship ever forward. Within six hours, you reached the shores of Agnafit, whose docks, normally crowded with fishing ships, now held double that amount in warships. In the town's main square, normally reserved for market stalls, there were soon hundreds and thousands of you. Up high on a platform normally reserved for proclamations stood Rurik, the leader of your expedition east. He was leaner than you'd imagined, with long red hair indicating his origins further south, and a neatly groomed beard that had to either side of it mouth-mustache hair sweeping over in large tufts. In your society, looks sometimes dictated the worth of a warrior, but so too did their actions on the battlefield, and sometimes the two did not meet as expected. Rurik was one such man. He was an eloquent and persuasive speaker, but also a warrior of much fame, but by merely looking at him, he looked more a rune carver than a warrior. There were many tales, however, of men who similarly misjudged Rurik, and they were now dining with their ancestors. The blast of horns silenced the crowd, followed by Rurik's voice rising, but also not as deep as imagined. Svir, we head for Aleborg to the east. We will not raise weapons or shield as we have been invited to restore order. Any men not abiding by this will be dealt with under the strictest measures. There will be plenty of conflict and the rewards of such in due time. We leave in the morn at first light. In one of the many halls of the town, you sat to eat a quiet meal and listen to a scald or two. The place was filled and noisy, 
but what drew your attention was a nearby table of four. You had seen their kind individually on occasion, but never in a group, bearskins and wolfskins. They were capable of drawing on Odin, it was said, Thor, Tur, and Freya's power directly, but in unpredictable ways during battle. Among them, a female that caught your attention. She was clearly a wolfskin and roughly your age, but there was something else about her that intrigued you, something akin to your mother only in both the physical and spirit. Raven feathers covered the shoulders of her cloak. She was clearly an equal, but there was something else you couldn't put your thumb on. She met your repeated stares with a smile and stood up and approached you. Well, wolf cub, are you going to stare all night or join us? You fumbled for words, but were left with no choice but to follow as she turned back towards her table. Perhaps this was it. She could sap the will of men with just a few words, leaving them helpless, but to obey. She pointed at the two large bearskins seated before you. These are the brothers Njal and Aga. Each was half again as large as you in all directions. Both had welcoming smiles and greeted you. She continued, and this wolfskin on the left is Trolls, and to his right, Arna. If you are thinking perhaps these are the brothers as they look even more alike than Yalandaga, you would not be alone with your first impression. We all thought the same. The wolfskin Arna responded with a chuckle. That is because they have different fathers. Yalandaga both immediately replaced their smiles with fierce stares at Arna, but after a few seconds, both laughed mightily, and soon the group with you at its table was in deep conversation, with much shared laughter. You discovered they had met the previous year during a raid against the Franks. The she-wolf's name was Revna, meaning Raven, and she was an orphan who'd been raised between groups of distant relatives. Before the evening was over, an invitation was extended to join them on their ship. You'd accompanied your uncle on trade voyages to the neighboring Savo and Hami tribes to the northeast and to the Gotar just south of you, but you'd never voyage directly east, certainly never this far. The waves of the Austmar were not high, but they surged closer to the shore. You knew not what to expect. In the morning, you saw half of the 350 ships and roughly 20,000 men making their way out in an impressive line that stretched longer and longer into the horizon. Your ship soon joined them, and within minutes was out into the open waters. Once there, the ships began to sing the songs of glory and of fame. All of your small group were decent singers with the exception of Revna. Her singing was atrocious, but mercifully drowned out by the base of you men around her. Perhaps her parents had some prior knowledge to naming her as her squawks were name appropriate, and yet she continued to intrigue you. The journey to the eastern shore took three days and nights. Upon arrival at the beach, it was said that the elders of the four united Slavic tribes were there to greet Rurik and his two brothers, but with the mass of ships around you disembarking, you saw only thousands of men milling about on the beaches. It would be said in later generations by some that your people were welcomed by the elders with open arms, but Loki has a way of spinning truths to mean all manner of things. There were two elders of the larger tribes who had persuaded the call to Rurik, but the elders of the two minor tribes were not so open to the arrangement, although they stood at their side for public show. Rurik was no fool, though, and he would in due time clean out the arrangements wrought. For now, he took the large fortress near the water as his own and held a thing with invites to all the leading freemen of the four Slavic tribes to lay the provision for his rule. Latoka was the closest Slavic approximation for your people to pronounce for the town you all called Alaborg. It was located on the southeast shore of a lake by the same name. It had been a center of trade for all the nations of the Austmar for generations. You'd seen coins from the Frankish kingdom and even Franks on occasion. You'd also seen the stranger looking coins with what as a kid you called drunk runic style writing with each rune leaning into the next, coins that were said to come from further south. And the coins referred to the same one god as the Christians, although mentioning a messenger of this god. 
Never had you seen the original carriers of such coins. The peace was quickly established by Rurik, although there was word of unrest from tribes further south. You spent the first week with the wolf and bearskins, and it felt natural. They were viewed by many in the same way as you had been viewed, and it was as if kinship was felt without the need to elaborate. Of the most interest to you were the tales you heard in the drinking halls about the lands to the far south. You'd heard of a city of the Greeks, Greeks who called themselves Romans. The detail of the city, though, had been mythical, but here were travelers who had claimed to see it for themselves. One such merchant, a plump Gotar merchant trader easily in his fifth decade, wearing silk ribbons tied into his back hair braid, spoke to you all of the city. The city of the Greeks, Miklagard, is a city unlike anything the Franks have built, and is both new and as old as the gods. Many of the buildings rise higher than the tallest trees, and there is a building of the cross whose ceiling like a giant troll hill covers it as a roof. Hundreds of thousands of people live in the city and among almost as many buildings. It sits protected on three sides by water and all sides by giant walls that rise even higher than the buildings and they are as thick as cave walls. Never has an enemy breached those walls. They say the city was founded by a god-king, Constant. You could place all of Rurik's men into the city and they could lose each other for days. Surely this was nonsense, you felt. How could such a city exist? Until seen with your own eyes, you dismissed it as the rambling exaggerations of a tired old merchant with skaldic ambitions. In the third week of your stay at Aliborg, the call was issued for 5,000 men to travel south under the leadership of Rurik's two younger brothers, Askold and Dur. There was unrest at one of the trading posts under the rule of the people known as the Khazars. They had been lax of late in enforcing law, and chaos had erupted. Chaos that was disrupting trade up to Aliborg, and order needed to be restored. There was a river system that was said to bring travelers not only to the place of unrest you would be going, but even further south to the fabled city of the Greeks Miklagard that you had heard the rambling merchant go on about. Where your people differed from others was not just in the gods that you worshipped, but your tactics in war. Many peoples had conventions when it came to warfare that would not allow them to bend their thinking and it would become over time thick and rigid with tradition. Your people thought differently. For example, others would, if traversing the same type of distance, do it in a slow train of marching and horse riding. The problem being that it would be at the pace of the weakest link, the marchers. They would also leave their ships at the largest of waterways, while your people took their ships with them overland if the waterways presented themselves as these in the eastern lands most certainly did. This allowed your army to traverse with your unique ships the shallow and deeper rivers both. The short strips of land that separated the plentiful waterways would be stripped of wood as required that would be used to roll the ships to the next waterway. And so your army set forth with Askold and Dur at its head. They were both much larger than their brother and while intelligent, not near so as Rurik or as eloquent of tongue, but what they were was fiercely loyal to their older brother, and Rurik's word was their command. Your army swept down the river system towards a yet unknown enemy. What would be the outcome? Find out in the next episode of the new Your Life as a Viking series. I want to thank you for watching. If you like this video, please hit the like button. If you haven't yet subscribed, but enjoy the content on the channel, I'd love to have you on board your history. As always, and until the next video, cheers. Goluvasum, Gulingambi Saweker Hordolva, Ather your fathers and honor Gaylor, Firioth Nathan Sor Trouther Honey at Solum Hailyar. Gernu Gamrmio, Firni Paheli Feister Moonsleep Nine Freki Reynar, Fjold Wetek Fruda. 
from so ek lengra um ragna rock rum siktiwa. In March of the year 860, your army of 5,000, led by the brothers Askold and Deer, was being sent south by Rurik of Latoga to restore order in the southern reaches of the Slavic lands. Between you and the south were lands belonging to the allied tribes, but also to the tribes not so keen of the union between your people and theirs. Even further south, the land of the Khazars, and beyond that, the fabled Miklagard. The territory you passed through first belonged to the Kravici. Your guides had explained to you how they were named after their ancient forefather, Kriv, and that their name meant blood relationship, implying the meaning in your language of blood kin. You passed through several farming villages, including one where you were able to see a gathering with your own eyes. Their culture was very traditional to your sphere standards. One of the guides explained that their view was that the gods created the world once and for all time, and that no new laws should modify the way of life passed down to them by Kriv, the forefather. You had spent most of your time with the skins and had grown even closer. Your group, one of several responsible for hunting and foraging for the army. An army which bartered and purchased much of what it needed from the villages, like these ones, on the route south but hunting and foraging also played a big part. Revna, the wolf skin with the raven feathers, was a pupil of all things that grew in the wild. She could differentiate the mushrooms of nourishment from those of visions and those of certain instant or lingering death. While you were an able hunter and could forage for basics, you could previously identify perhaps one or two edible mushrooms at most, and thus learned a lot from her and from the others. Revna's wearing of feathers, these weeks later, now made more sense as well. You'd heard from the others that Revna could fight like a she-wolf when required, but preferred stealth, likening herself exactly to an opportunistic raven. This was the source of something else you learned about her, her nickname of Odin's Raven, which the others had affectionately dubbed her with. During your last day in the territory of the Kravici, you joined several hunting parties in a celebration of your trip south to restore trade and order. It also afforded you a glimpse into their religion. They believed in a forest spirit called the Leshi, the Leshi who assigned and portioned out prey to hunters. You found this odd. Njorn was your god of the wind and sea and hunting, and while fate was itself shaped by the Norn, and an important part of your people's beliefs to you, it seemed your gods would not interfere in such matters, preferring instead the fate of armies and entire regions of people to whether you were fated to catch a deer or not. Other gods were similar to your own. Peron was much like Thor as the Slavic god of the sky, thunder, and war. However, among your people, Thor's hammer Mjolnir was often worn by men and women alike for protection. Among the common Slavic people you came across that were equivalent in station to you, there was no such similar symbols. In fact, it was mostly only the chiefs and rulers who would follow him. Then there was Strybog, the god of the winds and of weather, from soft rain to raging storms. He was said to be the ancestor of the winds of the eight directions. He was the connector of the heavens and the earth, and according to the guides, while he was a brave and fearless warrior, he was said to be often angry and short-tempered. For the Slavic farmers, though, he was the most important god, as he brought rain for the crops. For you, the most interesting was Svarog, whose son was the sun deity. Svarog was the god of blacksmiths and of celestial fire. You knew well that the secret of steel was stolen from the dwarves by Loki and dropped where you men found it. The Slavs, however, believed that the smith's prongs fell from the sky, which of course did not address where the secret of steel itself came from in the first place. Either way, their techniques of smithing were much as yours. In fact, for generations, trade and exchange smithing knowledge between your two peoples took place. 
Your time with Revna and among the Slavic tribes awakened a thirst for knowledge within you. While you were not quite ready to give up an eye for it, or hang yourself on Uktrasil, but here, far from home, you began to absorb everything you could. The skins you'd assumed were merely berserker in battle. But you were wrong. Much of what they did was stealth-based. They were trained to survive off the land and scout ahead often for days. Each day, you were learning more. For starting fires, you would often use flint and steel with either birch or ash bark. However, they showed you how to also start fire with quartz stones, and failing the ability to find the right type of stone, simply two sticks. They also always kept a fungus you learned to identify that they then soaked in urine and stressed to you while weapons were important, this would be your most important tool to stay alive when living off the land. We have gotten soft in our houses, Nyalandaga would say. The journey overland soon fell into predictable cycles. You and the other skin groups would scout with the guides the best overland route for the ships to the next portion of navigable river. The thralls acted as log bearers. They would place each log in front of the ship and the rest would push the boat along. Each time a ship passed over a log, it was returned to the front, and so on. With a coordinated group, ships could be moved overland, not as fast as a marching army, of course, but much faster than any enemy would expect. The going was through forested lands with occasional clearings in the form of meadows. Your trip had wound south and east and even west at times. After many weeks, you were on the river the locals called Dnieper, meaning river on the far side, which your Krivich guides indicated fed into the land on one side of the Dregovich and on the other side, the eastern Polans tribe. The area was under the rule of the Khazar, a people that, according to the guides, did not settle here until recent times, having previously lived via horses and moved from place to place around the eastern and northern reaches of the lands of the Greeks. From there, they had grown their lands westward and even northward to the destination you were headed. Their capital was called Attil and it was located far to the east, even further east than the eastern shores of the Great Sea north of Miklagard. After some sixty days, you were still at least a week out from the town. Askold and Dürr sent the skins to scout the land surrounding the town and the town itself for information. Your group, with a few dozen others, including the guides, were tasked with entering the town. You posed as traders, bringing in furs, to trade with the local population. The various groups traveled mostly at night to not alarm them. The town itself sat on the western bank of the river atop a hill of some 125 meters. The brothers Njal and Aga roamed the traveler locations, Trolls and Arne, the smaller villages surrounding the town, and you and Revna, the places of commerce. In a traveler's lodge, you were told by the locals that the Khazars were exerting higher and higher taxation. The reason? Pressure on their southwestern borders from a nomadic tribe by the name of the Pechenegs. The Pechenegs, they said, controlled increasingly larger tracts of land around the large sea that led to Miklagard. One thing was clear, and it shone brighter than the conflict between the Khazar and the Slavic townsfolk who were paying them fealty. Miklagard's influence. The coins you'd rarely seen as a child were everywhere here, as were luxuries you could not have in your wildest imaginings conceived of. All of you noticed it. The clothing, the food, the pottery, the metalware, and the glassware. The latter, carried by a man of the Christian cross, calling himself Cyril. He was from Miklagard, sent to convert others to his cross. He stood in the midst of the town's main square, holding what you would learn was a fibrous wonder upon which words could be written, much like the rune stones of home, only this could be carried and stored much easier. He was holding this while speaking to a small group of locals who seemed to be paying more attention to the material goods he carried and the possibilities of trade than word of his cross. You'd seen glass, but nothing approaching this quality and certainly not in shape or material, for he carried a glass wine jug that you could peer clear through. It was clear that, though taxation increased, 
the Khazar men carrying out the enforcement had not. Perhaps a thousand of the men were in the vicinity of the town and the villages, with roughly half garrisoned in the town itself. With the intelligence gathered and the assigned two days to scout over, the various groups made their way back to the main hidden camp. Askold and Deer asked for you personally. You were led into their tent. It was told to me that you saw a man of the cross in the town. Tell me about him. You told Askold that he was said to come from Miklagard and of the strange glass you saw. Askold's eyes glimmered and he turned to speak to his brother. Dear, we take the town as you suggested. We need the man of the cross alive. I want to question him. He turned back towards you and addressed you again. Your group will leave again tonight. Get close to this man of the cross. Learn his places of visit. We will attack the town in four days as evening falls. The townsfolk leader will send the signal. Ensure when we do, this man of the cross is captured for us to speak to. That night, your group questioned you about your conversation with Askold and Deer. You told them of the conversation and the plans for the next few days. Njal spoke up. Then it is time for much drink and revelry, for we do not know what the next few days will bring. So that night, you, Njal, Aga, Revna, Trolls, and Arna laughed and drank. It was good to have comrades, a group of misfits like yourself, and hoped it would last in the days and weeks to come. The plan was for the other advanced groups of skins to sabotage as many horses as they could before the signal. They would remove saddles and equipment from the horses to ensure time was on your and the local townspeople's side. Part of your army would also ensure that the town would have no escape. Escape that could alert others from nearby garrisons. The rest would, along with the townspeople, attack the Khazars once the signal was provided. Your group entered the town that first day in the morning, and you set about each shadowing the man of the cross. His routines were consistently unpredictable during the day. He seemed to go wherever whim and fancy took him, almost by the hour. An interesting conversation with an elder or merchant continued sometimes for hours. His charisma was undeniable, and he seemed to be able to overcome most any objection. The only consistency was his penchant for nightly drink, which tended to start in the late afternoon and continued well into the evening. If he was charismatic during the day, he was a veritable scald by night, attracting large crowds that only grew as he got more inebriated and animated. Now what he spoke of you had no clue, but whatever it was brought looks of awe, surprise, and even glee to most of those he spoke to, unlike the crowds he spoke to during the day. The night of the planned attack, Revna kept an eye out for the townsman responsible for the signal. You had met with him the previous day, and he was to start an accidental hay fire at one of the higher visible points atop the hillside. You were in the tavern with the rest of the group watching the now familiar routine of the man when cries began to ring out among the Khazars in their strange tongue. Your people had initiated their attack. There would be no pillaging of goods or slaughter of townsfolk provided they stuck to the accord struck with Askold and Deer. The common enemy were the Khazars and they would not be spared. You released Fenrir your hammer from the straps of your back as a group of six Khazars that had been seated at the far side of the room raised themselves from their table with their weapons drawn and approached. The weapons were swords about as long as yours but with a slight curve to them. They wore red and purple tunics and although it had been a while for the familiar feeling of combat excitement, it overcame you and your vision narrowed, focused on the Khazar that approached you. He appeared your age and swung his sword at you in a way that was unfamiliar, but you were able to block with Fenrir, catching the blade in the inner angle of your hammer blade. You turned the hammer as you had so often trained, bringing Fenrir's towards the man's belly. He was strong, but no match for your strength honed via years of farming and blacksmithing. You pushed Fenrir down and into the man's belly with the tooth side, tearing it along his length. The look of shock overcame the man as he looked down to see his own entrails sticking out of the fresh wound. 
You then mercifully took the blunt edge of Fenrir and collapsed the man's head on his left side, which caused his eyes to freeze in that shocked look and him to crash lifeless into the table. As you turned, a blade bit deep into your left shoulder and you staggered backwards, losing your grip on Fenrir, which fell near the feet of the man you had just slain. This Khazar, a full head taller than you, continued his advance, seeing his opportunity of you now prone and weaponless, and he lunged forward with his weapon aimed at your chest. As he lunged, though, he barked in pain, turning towards the source. There, Revna stood, with her dagger now protruding from the back of the man. You reached for Fenrir, just as Revna thrust a second dagger into the man's midsection. He lashed out at her with the hilt of his sword, striking her jaw and collapsing her to the floor. With Fenrir now firmly in your grasp, you brought its teeth down the man's back next to the dagger and then spun round bringing Fenrir up high and ending any further opposition. You helped a clearly dazed Revna to her feet just as the sounds of combat from the others ebbed. With the battle won, you looked around in panic as the man you were to keep an eye on was no longer present. You sprinted out of the tavern, seeing him in the distance, clearly walking under the influence of drink, trying to stagger away towards what you knew was the wealthier part of town. You were able to catch up to him and bring him back to the others, despite constant protestations, none of which you understood. You tied the man, and your group attempted to make its way through the fighting in the town toward Askold and Deir as planned. The Khazars were not finished fighting, however, and you soon found yourself outnumbered and surrounded. The Khazars surrounding you on all sides moved in closer. You kept a hold of the Christian Cyril with your left arm behind you as each of you stood back to back with weapons drawn. There were certainly less honorable ways to die. You were satiated and you held Fenris firmly in your right hand. Dying to a foe that outnumbered you, would all but ensure the Valkyries bring you to be welcomed into Odin's Hall. That is, if the fates demanded it end that way, you were still determined to live and take as many of these Khazars as you could. As you remember the battle, in later years, one of the Khazar took a step forward, just as two to either side of him turned towards something. You hadn't seen it yet, but the Wolfskins did, and both charged forward, causing the Khazars facing them to step back. Another lunged forward at you, but you angled enough to the left while raising your right arm and brought Fenrir crashing down into the man's helmet, causing him to slump lifeless to the ground at your feet. You then saw a large group of Askold's men running towards the Khazars from the right and another seconds later from the left. The next instant, a chorus of clanging steel and battle cries, followed by the sound of dying Khazar and Northerners, but mostly Khazar. Again, you brought Fenris down hard upon the upper back of a Khazar who made the mistake of turning too close to you. He too fell limp to the ground where he was finished with an axe strike to his chest. The battle raged for some 20 minutes with your men keeping a protective circle around Cyril to prevent his escape. Outnumbered and having lost half their men, the Khazars attempted to fall back but Askald's men were on them, cleaving them to the ground. The battles would rage for another 30 minutes but ultimately end in triumph for your side. Soon, the city was yours. The Slavic population, trading one master for another, appeared suspicious of their stability having been upended, but in the years to come, trade would flow not just south, but to and from the north where Rurik had stationed himself. This would bring prosperity and importance to this town on the hills beside a river. Messengers were sent to Rurik, who sent many additional men to the town, increasing its population substantially from what it had been under the Khazars. The Christian holy man Cyril, he would provide valuable information as he had studied and learned not only the language of the Khazars and Slavs, but their ways and their customs. And over the next 11 weeks, he would learn much of your language too. And while he appreciated drink more than anyone you had known, he held a vast amount of information, both trivial and amazing. His stories, sometimes sounding too fantastic to be real, 
many of these tales coming from the city he hailed from, a city he said held more people than all the towns you had visited from your home to here. A city holding riches and treasures dating back hundreds of years to the time of the city's founder and his namesake. Going into detail that while he was known as Cyril, his full name was in fact Constantine. These treasures and riches, he said, were protected by walls so strong and high that they had never been breached by an enemy. The other activity that Cyril enjoyed was talking about his god. Most of the men indulged him this passion as it meant discovering more about the lands further to the south. Mostly though, they wanted to hear more about Miklagard or the great city as everyone came to call it. Askold and Dürr continued to press Cyril on details of the city, particularly when his mastery of the language had improved to the point of being able to explain in terms that you could understand. Cyril was only too happy to oblige. We are Romehi, he said, and our capital has stood for over 700 years. It is the glory of our empire and of God, its name whispered by the saints throughout the lands to the south, rich in fame but richer yet in wealth. Flailing his arms during his stories and animating his expressions like a spastic scald, Wine was the preferred drink of his people, made from grapes which had found its way into the towns and cities here. Your people knew of this fruit and had heard of the drink as it would sometimes make trade routes to you, but most of you preferred ale or mead. You certainly felt as if much of what he talked about were the ravings of someone who was at the bottom of a wineskin. They sounded like many of your skull tales an example of this was his talk of the city's ships being able to breathe fire. A fire so strong it could not easily be put out. Your tales spoke of dragons, but few sober men claimed to have actually seen one in person, yet he spoke of regularly seeing ships breathing fire? Ridiculous, you decided. Although he did carry another secret that fascinated you infinitely more. He carried a dagger of some ten inches in length, although everyone doubted he could wield it and assumed it was mostly ceremonial. Your first time touching the dagger, you knew instantly it was something special. It was stronger and more finely crafted than you'd ever seen. Its strength seemed equally distributed throughout its length, to where even the hilt was forged with the same steel, although bound in leather. A magnificent pattern, betraying the various ingredients and layers, could be seen throughout its length. How was such a dagger forged? Cyril had no answers, only that he purchased it from Saracen merchants who did trade with people further down south. He explained in detail how the lands to the south held a Saracen empire that indirectly traded with and battled with his people's empire. The Saracen's empire capital sat on one of two mighty twin rivers. The capital's name, Baghdad, coming from a people further east and translating loosely to God's greatness. This would be routine over the course of many more nights until Askold and his brother felt they had bled much of his information from him. The talk then among your people changed to seeing this great city for yourselves and taking of its great wealth a wealth that by the sound of Cyril's tales wouldn't be missed, owing to how much it held. It would finally dawn on the holy man that he had divulged much of what would be used to attack the city. He then discovered that while he wasn't a prisoner and was free to roam around within the camp, he was not able to leave it, and would accompany you all south. Still, despite this, his protestations seemed more like those of a man going unto his death. He would frequently mention the walls and fire-breathing ships, but you and your people laughed these off. Ships breathing fire and walls that couldn't be climbed, ringing an entire city with more people than you'd ever seen in your lifetime? Impossible. He indicated the river system turned gradually rougher and that the rapids for a two-day stretch were not possible to navigate. 
He also spoke at length about the turmoil in the lands to the south, a series of conflicts and large tribes on the move. One such people he called the Pechenegs. They spoke a dialect of the Khazar language and they were often at war with them, having been driven from their homelands in the east to the southern lands where they in turn pushed another people whom he called the Ten Arrow Tribes further west. Askold and Deer had heard enough. Miklagard would part with some of its treasure hoard, willingly or unwillingly, and after all, if the city fell, how could the other not? Your comrades would stay in the north to assist Rurik and lead additional groups south to Kiev. Although you didn't look forward to parting, the dagger had now become an obsession, and you would find its source. And they understood that. Just as all understood that Miklagard would soon meet your people and relinquish its vast treasure holds. These were faded certainties. The next three weeks you spent some time with your friends, but the majority was spent with Cyril, and between you two, a form of communication and even friendship had developed that was sufficient for non-complex communication. He would tell you tales of his god and try to persuade you to his beliefs, but your bond to your people and your gods was strong and not so easily broken. The last night with your friends was memorable and predictable, laughter and drink, both in abundant supply. In the morning, roughly half of your people in just over 200 ships of varying sizes and thousands of men set out down the river system. You were all aware of the Khazar horsemen who mostly kept a watchful eye but cautious distance as you headed south. They seemed content with your people not diverting inland after they had established a path you were taking. The weather was now turning from winter to spring and slowly the days were warming. The river system as it turned south was getting stronger and fiercer and progress slowed as much of the river systems were simply too hazardous to travel safely. The rapids here dropped in places tens of meters with large pointed and jagged rocks either jutting haphazardly out of the water or laying even worse just under its surface. A few ships were damaged trying to navigate through the obstacles before it was decided to just repeat the previous method of overland travel with the ships to the next calmer portion. You counted at least nine major rapids and 30 to 40 smaller ones that completely obstructed your passage through. There were no sightings of the people he referred to as the Ten Arrow tribes, but the Pechenegs. They would introduce themselves on the morning after the waters again calmed enough for travel. The leader of their scouting party approached with a small retinue and no arms drawn. Cyril informed your people they were interested only in trade and not conflict. They appeared tired and hungry and were currently on the move having fought in the east and now heading inland after this group of Ten Arrow tribes. Your people would trade and exchange fish and grain for livestock. You stayed as close to Cyril as possible, asking him questions about these people. Growing a bit weary of your incessant questions, he introduced you to one of the Pechenegs. His name was Ayaz, which you were told meant cold breeze. He was one of the leaders, and he would accompany you as far south as the big sea and act as a guide. You took an immediate liking to each other and would develop over the next weeks a language of your own and what you could not communicate, Cyril would translate. You learned more of the Saracens through Ayas who had interacted with them. For example, the Saracens also believed in the same one God, both sides claiming to represent the true word and intent of this same shared one God. All of this was rather confusing, and you took comfort in your pantheon of gods, you felt the relationship between your people and the gods was less gray and more black and white. While these other people worried about what they had done in life and the resulting judgment on them at their deaths, your people did not. Sure, there were regrets of things, but no judgments from the gods other than to die with honor and with your brothers. This knowledge was carried into battle by every Northman, and it was enough to displace most mortal concerns. 
Ayas was interested in your weapon Fenrir and admired its balance and weight. You explained to him that you were a blacksmith, which he seemed to admire. His people used a bow with a slight recurve, and they were excellent with their aim while on horseback. Your people also revered horses, and it was not uncommon for warriors of high status to be buried alongside their steeds. However, the Pechenegs, they took this to the next level, treating their horses almost as family and closer than even dogs in terms of company among men. And horses added to their ability to wage war, acting more as companion soldiers. As your group took to the river, he and his small band traveled alongside on their horses, meeting back up with you to camp at night. The lands here soon gave way to a large estuary with towering granite cliffs, and soon your first sighting of the sea Cyril called Hospitable Sea. Gentle waves rolling from an endless horizon of water. This did much to boost the morale of your people. While land was familiar, water was where you all truly found your compass. Your people made camp and would head across the sea towards Miklagard in the early hours. Ayas had decided to accompany your people to Miklagard. He knew your reason and your people's reason. There was no judgment, but he would split off from your group to speak to the great king of Miklagard to seek securities for his people, who had for over a generation known only constant war. The journey to the south along the western coastline would take just over a week. Sails for your ships were prepared throughout the day until every ship was ready. Then, as evening fell, a group of your best scalds sang and told the most heroic tales. Tales of treachery and tales of unsurpassed heroism and glory. And the next day, your fleet of 200 ships and over 9,000 men began the journey along the coastline, repeating the routine of going to shore at the end of the third day. Inland, a series of caves were found adjoining granite cliffs, the men daring each other to climb still higher as their drinking increased. You climbed a bit, but heights were never something that gave you great comfort. Feet were meant to be firmly on the ground or atop the wood of a ship, not in the heights like some cliff bird. One chief, an older man of some 40 years, was determined to show the others he retained the agility and strength of his youth. Considering his level of drunkenness, it was amazing to most of you that he managed to climb as far as he did. However, his age and bravado caught up with him at roughly 20 meters. When a missed grip caused him to fall down, hitting several outcroppings on his way down and finally cracking his head like an egg when he met the ground. The night, as a result, turned to funeral preparation. When a chieftain died, his slaves and servants would be asked who would die with him that night. The one volunteering could then not alter this decision as it was binding. In this particular case, it was a young woman who was treated with great courtesy while the burial was being prepared. His ship was drawn up on land and people walked around it and said words to their now dead chief. A bier placed on it as were cloths and cushions by an old woman who was called the Angel of Death. She was responsible for all final preparations. The chief's body was taken up and dressed in splendid garments, and he was placed seated among the cushions in the tent on his ship, with alcoholic drink, food, aromatic herbs, and all his weapons. Then a dog and eight hens were killed and placed on the ship with him. The woman who was to die went round to select tents and had carnal relations with the owner. After this, she performed various other rituals sacred to your people. She was raised three times above something which was made to look like an arch, and said, I see my master sitting in paradise, and it is beautiful and green, and with him are men and youth, and he calls me, lead me to him. Then she killed a hen and was taken to the ship where she took off her jewelry, drank two beakers, and sang, and finally was taken into the tent to her dead master by the angel of death. Six men followed her into the tent and also had carnal relations with her. Then, 
she was killed. The closest relative of the deceased chief now lit the firewood under the ship. Others threw more flaming brands on the fire, and within one hour, everything was burnt. They then built a mound on the spot and raised a pole at its center with the name of the chieftain and his king on it. Your fleet then resumed its journey south. Ayas and you said your goodbyes as he parted over land with his band for the remainder of the journey. On the early morning of the seventh day in the hospitable sea, you approached the city of Miklagard through a narrow channel. To your right, the city's walls, which to your eyes looked like cliff faces. You'd pictured walls in your mind, but nothing prepared you or the other men for what these looked like. Cyril's descriptions of them was boastful, to be sure, but if anything, they undersold how incredibly strong and impossibly high they looked. And they grew only higher as your fleet approached. The gates, which you saw open, closed just as your first ships drew upon the coastline. Your people knew well how to wage war on fields and ships, but they lacked the engineering and experience to tackle any type of siege warfare. Still, there was much of the city's suburbs and environs not protected by the wall, which did protect its most valuable core. It would be described by their empire's chroniclers in their writing and on their calendars that your people suddenly, on the morning of the 18th of June in the year 860, and without warning, descended like a swarm of wasps. You would also find out later that the Emperor and the most elite of his army were away fighting the Saracens, and with them, the fleet of ships that breathed fire. Unknowingly, they had created the perfect storm, the perfect welcome for your arrival. As interested as you were in pillaging wealth, you were far more interested in finding the secret of the forging of Cyril's dagger. Cyril, who had served his purpose, had expected to be freed, but Askold elected to keep him nearby. You and your people looted and massacred much of the population in the suburbs. The housing, mostly wooden, and many of the people living in squalid filth. Their chroniclers would also write that your people were savages without written words. True, your people chronicled mostly orally and runes were used but selectively. What these chroniclers failed to mention though was how your people bathed and groomed themselves compared to these civilized people. You generally bathed weekly if not every few days, grooming hair, cleaning ears. These were as important among your people as farming and survival. While you held Fenrir, you also carried a comb, a razor, and bones to clean your ears. Yet, you would be chronicled as the savages for your beliefs and ferocity. It made little sense, but such were the fates, not to always be easily understood by men. The ferocity and fury of your Northmen would continue. Although the walled portions of the city core were saved from your continued presence, the suburbs on either side and the islands of this narrow sea were not. All opposition was crushed, armed, unarmed, anything within sight was brought down. On one island, your group attacked a splendid-looking group of buildings that Cyril said belonged to an exiled patriarch of his church. The patriarch was not there during your attack, but many of his followers were. Your people took them onto the ships, hacking them to pieces and throwing them into the narrow sea. Cyril, rightfully, was terrified and utterly shocked at their fate. You understood he saw his fate in those actions, so you sought to reassure him by telling him he was with your people and thus safe. This did little to reassure him, and the only thing that comforted him and kept him from whimpering to his god was drink. For six weeks, your people ravaged the surrounding environs. During the sixth week, you discovered that the Emperor had slipped back into the city with his army under the cover of night. Cyril, in a rare moment of sobriety, asked you to take him into the city, promised riches for your people. The Emperor, he said, would likely pay to have your people depart. You sought counsel with Askold and Deer, and presented Cyril's proposal. They had already loaded their ships, but the thought of additional gold and riches outnumbering what was already taken, that was tempting. Cyril, sober and likely with the foresight of knowing what happened to the exiled Patriarch's men, 
would make a convincing argument, stating everything he had said to date had been correct about the city. He spoke of statues made entirely of gold that could be loaded on the ships for the asking price of simply leaving. The brothers agreed, but with the caveat that no commitments would be made beyond a year. There would be no binding peace treaties, only their leaving. Cyril happy for any grasp on self-preservation, hastily agreed. He had trust among the nobility in the city and with the emperor himself and would thus get you into the city. It had over 30 fortified gates. The largest on the west side of the city that faced land could see exit and entry of the entire army in minutes, while many of the gates facing the sea sections have been designed with the intent of allowing only enough room for organized single-file entry. One such gate Cyril called the Gate of the Lion, and he would take you through that gate as it lay near the royal core of the city. The evening before your journey into the city, Cyril prepared you with additional information he had previously mentioned. I am a friend in the Emperor's wider circles. We both enjoy the Hippodrome races. Yes, quite enthusiastically. He could see by the look of puzzlement on your face that you had no idea what a Hippodrome was, despite him trying to describe it to you with words in your own language. Sensing your frustration, he attempted to simplify his description. It is a large area where horses with riders and chariots race. The shape is like this, he said, using a stick to draw a shape like a circle, pressed on two opposite sides, and then stretched. Thousands of people watch these races, each with their favorites, and some wager coin on the outcome to spice it up, you see. The Emperor Michael III is particularly enthusiastic and has his favorites as well, some of whom he has brought to official engagements, which caused quite the stir, I must say. Even won him some enemies it has. The Gate of the Lion brings us right before this hippodrome, its southern portion, an area I know quite well. Word will spread quickly when I announce us in the distance to the Emperor's quarters in his palace not far beyond. I would guess word will reach him quickly, and we will be brought straight to him, given the urgency of the situation. Askold and Deer had agreed to halt arms for the duration of your stay, which was not to exceed three days before an answer from this Emperor Michael was expected. You made your way to the Lion Gate with a banner color that Cyril said signified a truce for hostilities and identified you both as message bringers. As you neared the walls, you saw the detail of the stonework for the first time. The walls appeared as if they had been crafted by the gods themselves, rising higher than any buildings you or your people had ever put up and certainly stronger. Cyril made his proclamation at intentions clear before the gate with as much sobriety and conviction as you had heard uttered from his lips in the time you knew him. The gate was a series of multiple other gates arranged in sequence and each opening only when the previous had closed and vice versa. The guards eyed you with much curiosity as they led you through the gate walls. Each new section saw more guards join your group. Soon they numbered 30 guards as you were led through the final portion of the wall. The sight that met your eyes when Miklagard revealed itself after your passage through the walls was a sight you would remember to your last breath. The area was greener than you expected, with many gardens and much of a fine polished white stone that was smooth to the touch everywhere. To your left, Cyril pointed out the hippodrome he had described earlier, the southern portion of the arch-held walls rising many times your size above you. Whereas the exterior walls looked as if the gods had placed cliffs around the city, this was much more intricate and purposeful. Each arch a window through the exterior to the interior portion. Statues in the arches of various figures, each crafted by artisans with talents from the gods themselves. To your right, another wall surrounding what Cyril said was the public great palace of the emperor. A crowd was beginning to form around you as you were led further north between the Hippodrome and this great palace. Around you, yells from the growing crowd, even a few things thrown, but the guards 
formed a tight circle around you. You reached a magnificent gate entrance, which was attached to a rectangular building with four piers supporting a large central dome, which itself rested on four large arches in a similar fashion as the arches on the Hippodrome you'd seen. The guards pushed the still-growing crowd of people to the sides as the gate was opened. The gate itself containing beautiful craftsmanship of icons likely to their god. As you enter, the true awe of what you have witnessed since entering the city manifested around you. The walls decorated with slabs of multicolored marbles and the ceilings covered with small tiles making up various scenes, lifelike scenes like from a dream, the scenes of a long-dead emperor king and his wife flanked by nobility and greeting some great warlord general who had brought with him tribute in the form of captive chiefs from some far-off place. On the outer edge, where this domed ceiling met the walls, were interior arches with various magnificent statues. Cyril, seeing your awe, only smiled as you were led further into the great palace. You next walked through a garden that seemed nature but in order, something that looked strange but beautiful. Water flowed upwards and spouted into the air and an overabundance of plants and flowers. At the other side of the garden, you were led into a hall even more magnificent than the last. A man inside the next hall met you, whom you would learn later was the royal eunuch. This was a man who had that which made him a man removed as a young child. He had no facial hair and his skin as smooth as any woman's or young child's. Cyril continued to amaze you now, speaking in yet another tongue which you did not understand. While they spoke, you were searched again, even though you had approached the city with no weapons and were already searched at the gate. After a few minutes, you were led into a courtyard and then another hall that looked as if Odin himself would use it. More treasure than you had ever seen in your life to date, occupying the hall, gold objects, silver, and those bejeweled covered every inch. This was clearly a statement of opulence to those like yourself that a great emperor ruled here. You were finally led into a very large throne room. The room dripped in gold and boasted the most magnificent display of wealth. Behind the massive golden throne, trees made of hammered gold and silver, complete with jewel-encrusted mechanical birds, wound around the base of the tree, golden lions and griffins staring menacingly from beside each armrest, looking as if they could spring up at any moment. The throne itself was of immense size and sat on a raised portion. On the walls, golden eagles and other birds of prey, as well as singing birds. The eunuch then made a sign for you to lay yourself to the ground. In your society, you did not kneel but only to a king or jarl who had your respect, and this did not extend to foreign kings. However, a look from Cyril forced your hand. He, a supposed friend of the king, was doing likewise, so you supposed you could feign the gesture, even if this emperor had done nothing to earn your respect. You recognized the name of the emperor when the eunuch proclaimed it, and the emperor then entered. You could hear the footsteps stop as he seated himself on the throne. Then suddenly, it was as if you had been taken elsewhere. Music began to play, but you'd not seen any musicians. Metallic sounds echoed against the sound of the music. You snuck a peek from your prone position, and to your shock, the throne was no longer there. The eunuch made a gesture and rose, as did you and Cyril, to the music still echoing in the chamber, and the noise you could now see was coming from the very lions and birds themselves. The statues moved of their own accord as if Odin himself had blown life into them. Most shocking of all was that the emperor was still on his throne, only now it was raised near the ceiling where he sat looking down upon you all. Cyril spoke on your behalf as the Emperor's throne made its way magically to the floor again, the two speaking back and forth, and the Emperor looking angered. This continued for several minutes until 
You were both dismissed to a large holding room in the Great Palace. You would wait here for several hours, Cyril explaining to you that a great feast was being prepared. You had so many questions, and Cyril, having more than enough time as you both waited, answered them all as he put back much wine provided for you both. He explained that the Emperor was threatening battle with your people and expulsion, forced expulsion, but that he had a plan, and he would explain it to you in time. For now, he said, you both needed the Emperor in a more natural state of drink and festivity. He also enjoys drinking as you do, you asked Cyril. Cyril laughed. Oh, my boy more. Gambling on the races and drinking are perhaps his two favorite pastimes, waging war for him as a distraction that removes his focus from those finer, baser instincts of his. However, do not think he does not have the means to wage war with your people, a war which your people will lose, but at a great cost to his own, and he knows this, and he soon will be reminded. There is someone else at court I discovered, our friend Ayas of the Pechen Eggs. He's been here for some weeks and will be at tonight's feast. Again, I cannot tell you the entirety of my plan, Wolfgar, but if it works, it will be the best outcome for all. You knew Cyril enough to know the best outcome would be one in which he himself had the most beneficial outcome. Still, you had no choice at this point but to put your additional trust into Cyril. You were in Miklagard with walls separating you from your people and no Fenrir to accompany you to any afterlife should any of these people seek to deliver you there. You agreed to give Cyril the time he needed, and your questions next went to the moving statues, music from thin air and the throne which could fly. Cyril laughed heartily, the wine splashing color all over his thick beard and spraying out into the room and on you. Tricks, my boy, meant to inspire awe and wonder in enemy and ally alike. There is a man we call Leo, and he can calculate with numbers alone amazing things you or I could not grasp in several lifetimes. He also works with these statues, we call them automata, which your language has no words for, but let us just say moving statues. Each part of the statue independent yet a part of the whole. He spoke at length about the wonders of this Leo, but grasping onto anything that made sense to you was futile. You know what you saw with your own eyes and what you heard with your ears, but an explanation? That would never be understood. To you, it may as well have been magic, as it was something more fantastic than you'd ever seen, even in the most bizarre of fever dreams. You were next led in to the banquet hall, which, like everything you had seen in the great palace, also was covered in intricate mosaics, bronze and gold statues, and the polished floors you now knew were marble. The tables themselves, longer than any you had imagined in Odin's hall, would look like. You were seated at the far end of the hall, near a raised table where the emperor would sit. Ayas was already seated and greeted you with a smile, and extended his hand for a shake. You had learned his handshake was lighter and longer than what your people typically gave, but you reciprocated. The Emperor Michael III next made his entrance, only after everyone was seated and a tremendous fanfare, dressed in impressive robes of a color you'd never seen before, Cyril telling you as the entrance music played that it was the color of the Imperial family. Seeing the Emperor walk, you noticed that he swayed to and fro, as if he had already begun drinking. He was accompanied by a strange, small-looking younger man. The man had a compacted face with small eyes and a large snout-like nose with lips protruding outwards. As he sat, he immediately began to drink. Food was served and many discussions were hammered out. Several times throughout the meal you were pointed to, and the room would go quiet, some angry voices shouting until they in turn were shouted down by the Emperor's inner circle. You knew the discussion was about you and that Cyril likely downplayed the severity of much of what was said about you and screamed at you, but you paid it not much heed. The small man from earlier who was now seated near the Emperor was loud and the more he drank, the more food would eject from his mouth while speaking and his language that, based on the looks of the other guests, 
needed no translations, was rough. Ayas had also become familiar with the Saracen delegation who sat to his side and spoke with an interpreter. Miklegard was a crossroad of many languages, you found out, and cultures, and many of the learned men acted as interpreters, as they had a firm grasp of the various languages spoken there. The festivities continued for hours with all manner of entertainment, music and dance that sounded and looked strange but had a mesmerizing quality to it. Cyril explained to you that he would have an audience alone with the Emperor the next day and that arrangements would be made for you to explore the city with Ayas and a retinue of the Imperial Guard. Cyril drank with his usual abandon, but you cautiously ensured you did not drink too much. Soon, Cyril was in his usual drunken state, and by the time you made your way back to the guest chambers, collapsed into a loud, snoring sleep. You stared at the ceiling for some hours, going over the events of the day and processing what you had seen before drifting off to sleep yourself. In the morning, you, Ayas, and your Imperial Guard companions headed out into the city with one of the eunuchs of the Imperial Court. He was versed in enough of the language of Ayas's people that he had served as translator as well as guide. You got the sense that this would be a meticulously planned tour with many sights off limits. The outer city had a smell to it that you noticed as you walked away from the great palace towards the central core of the city, a smell that wafted every time the wind blew. The smell of human bodily waste. Your guides pointed your attention to something in the distance. There, towering above everything else, was a mammoth column, at the top of which a statue of an emperor on horseback facing east. The sides of the streets filled with archways of green plants and trees, as well as merchants peddling their various wares. Approaching the column, you saw a building as large as all the separate buildings that made up the great palace, but in one single building. The roof of this massive structure was a half circle that sat atop it. Your guide stated that it was the largest holy building of their god, the building named Santa Sophia. You passed through a large triumphal gate of the smooth stone marble and into a large rectangular square whose length ran west to east. There were numerous shops and stands selling freshly cooked foods and drinks, and the people around you wore, like you, primarily wool and linen, but not with plain but intricate patterns, golden lines, various colors you had never seen for clothing. You were still struggling to conceive the amount of people you were seeing, with buildings as far as you could see. As your group walked westwards along a large street, filled again with shops and stalls to either side, you noted opulent wealth, but also those who appeared extremely poor, living side by side. Many of the larger buildings here aged in appearance, with greenery beginning to grow on them and visible cracks in their walls. Ayas asked the guards for a small detour, and they were happy to oblige. You were led off into a side street that had a population of Saracen merchants. Each alley weaved into the next, and it would likely take half a lifetime to learn your way around here, you thought. As you entered the fourth such alley, you heard the familiar clanking of a smith. Ayas smiled. You were obsessed with Cyril's dagger. Well... I have found the steel. These Saracens, they forge it. It comes in a large cake-like ingot which they craft into daggers and swords. My friend, this is Zion. The Saracen delegation made me aware of his services. He crafts and sells the strong iron you were looking for. Zion extended his left arm in greeting, and you shook hands, his grip strong like yours. With Aya's Acting as your translator, you had a million questions. Zion spoke of a region further south and east that he called Al-Hind. He mentioned that in the southernmost reaches of Al-Hind are the Hindi craftsmen who know the true secret to this iron. His people import the iron ingots as large cakes, which they then forge into the steel at a ratio of roughly three to one. Ayas could see your concern and desire. 
Friend, I have made provisions for you for some of these to be taken back with you. You thanked him, and you were usually a good judge of what the body said when words were absent. In quiet contemplation, perhaps, you would have noticed the sadness in Ayaz's face, when gift-giving is usually an act of joy. However, you missed it in the excitement of the moment, your eyes studying the swords and daggers already crafted, magnificent patterns swirling with various hues indicating the exotic ingredients of Al-Hind. You would return in the early afternoon, curious with how Cyril had made out. Only he didn't say anything, just that all would be revealed in its given time, telling you that the Emperor had a request for you both to accompany him to the Hippodrome to watch the day's chariot races. You entered the Hippodrome opposite the gate that you had used for the Great Palace. And if it was amazing on the outside, again, as with everything in this city, nothing prepared you for the inside. As usual, it made Cyril's telling you of the things understated in comparison with the reality once before you. The ground where the races were to be held, large enough to hold many armies. Along the length of the sides were twenty to thirty rows of seating for spectators, which you guessed could hold an almost equal amount of people. You were sat with Ayas and Cyril in a tier next to the Emperor and his guard, and an inner circle that you noticed were a different group of people than those at the court. Cyril made you aware of the small beardless fellow, who you immediately recognized with a snout-like nose and lips from the feast the day before. He is a chariot driver, the Emperor's favorite, Cyril said. His name is Himerios, which translates to most longer for, but his nickname, Cyril then quickly looked around to ensure no one was listening before continuing, is pig, for the reason you see with your eyes before you. You tell him you recognize him from the feast night. Yes, that is he, and it is said the Emperor has given him a hundred pounds of gold. Many disapprove of his company with the Emperor, but these are imperial matters, and uh, I try not to concern myself with those. The races were a spectacle to behold, each of the riders belonging to one of two colored teams, either green or blue. Likewise, the people in the rows watching supported riders of one side over the other. In this way, the stands were divided. People sang songs of support and cheered or jeered depending on who was in the lead. Musicians with instruments played them throughout the races. You discovered large sums of money wagered, much like your gambling games, but on a larger scale an entire economy growing around the races, at the top of which was the Emperor, who this day had not apparently fared too well, as evidenced by his gradual slide into drunken debauchery. Soon his actions almost mirrored that of the small man from the feast night. He became rude, obnoxious, and quite animated. On the evening of the third and last day, Cyril informed you that the Emperor had made a decision but rather than deliver it himself, he had Ciro and the royal eunuch deliver you the message. He would provide your people with a vast amount of gold on the condition that you leave immediately for your lands and he agreed to the condition of no return for the year. Askold and Deer agreed to these terms and soon your ships were laden with riches. Ayas, true to his word, had planned for the cakes of iron to be delivered and there was enough for many weapons. Although you did not see Ayas again, you would in future years discover the reason. During those three days, Ayas had made an arrangement with the Emperor for his people to ally themselves with Miklagard. Your people would not be hindered on their return trip, but in future seasons, attempts south would be met with hostility and open conflict by the Pechenegs. The Emperor had agreed to the year because it provided him with time to firm up the alliance and defenses of the city. It also explained the look Ayas had given you when giving you the gifts of the iron ingot cakes. You would bring these cakes with you over land and sea. You would meet up with your friends in the north and celebrated your good fortunes, but would see them less often over future years. Your obsession would become the new material to you 
It was more valuable than any of the gold as it represented a legacy for your family. Upon your return, you discovered your uncle had died of disease. You would go on, though, to craft amazing weapons with this new material. New trade routes would be opened that went further east and south into the lands of the Saracens, with whom you would establish connections for more of the iron. As a tribute to your uncle, you would stamp his name, Ulfbert, into each and every blade. Your blades would, in time, become renowned and desired for their strength and craftsmanship. And you would pass this trade on to your son, and he to his, for many generations, each stamping the sword with your uncle's name. In centuries to come, your people would raid far and wide. They would topple kingdoms, and they would establish their own. But soon, the religion of Ciro would convert your people, and your old ways would slowly die out, save for the sagas and folklore that would speak of your heritage. As time moved forward, the secret of the Ulfbert sword would be lost to time like much of your people's pagan past. However, centuries later, swords with the Ulfbert stamp would be found in your homeland and throughout the north of Europe, a testament to your life and family's legacy and the journey once taken.